Hey, welcome back once again, everybody. I am Colin Weaver. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day where I'm coming at you each time with two questions as I hopefully help you get better prepared to take the dreaded CISSP exam. Let's go to question number one. Which of the following is not a mitigation technique that can help you protect an application and its data? There's your answer choices. Think them through. Click pause if you need to. Click play when you're ready. We'll talk it through. First answer choice, fuzzing, best answer choice. Fuzzing is not a mitigation technique. Fuzzing is a way for you to identify vulnerabilities. Okay? You do not mitigate by using fuzzing. Yeah, if you want to find a, a problem with, a, with, say, an application, you can give it tremendous amounts of, you know, just kind of bogus and nonsensical input to see if you can get it to respond in an unpredictable way. And if so, that might serve as a foothold for you to be able to go in and find an actual exploitable vulnerability uh, within the actual application itself. And hopefully you're finding it before your attackers do. So definitely not in a, a technique for uh, mitigating vulnerabilities. Fuzzing is for identifying vulnerabilities. Choice number two says access control lists. Now, I, in my answer choice, I didn't really put ACLs in the context of, you know, like ACLs you, like you might see in a file system like in Microsoft with a security descriptor in the NTFS file system, or whether it was ACLs like you might find on a router or basic ACLs on a you know, packet filtering firewall. Um, either one of those, uh, particularly the firewall one, uh, could certainly go in and help to mitigate some risk because you can go in and say, only allow ports and protocols or traffic from certain sources that are gonna be you know, more likely to be trusted in valid sources. So it does offer some mitigations. Again, it's not the be all end all of mitigations, but it is definitely a mitigating factor. How about the third answer choice, digital signatures? Uh, yeah, digital signatures uh, do provide a measure of integrity and origin authentication uh, with your uh, data, whatever it is that you're actually signing. You know, again, the digital signature itself is just an encrypted hash, so it's not the actual integrity mechanism itself, but it's the thing that goes in and brings a level of trust and assurance to that hash by having us be able to go in and, and sign either the code or the data or whatever it is that we're doing. So yeah, that is a mitigation technique in terms of uh, helping you to go in and have better trust in, in, a, in, say, some data or in an application. How about disk quotas? Yes, disk quotas also help to uh, protect an application because you could go in, for instance, and make sure that disk quotas prevent the, the hard drive become, from becoming full. Um, so it's not at all uncommon that if a hard disk becomes full for things to not error out gracefully, they tend to crash pretty hard if they run out of disk space. And so by leveraging disk quotas, you might be able to go in and create a situation where the, the application is going to remain more available and you know, uh, otherwise more stable. How about encryption? Come on, you're making stuff secret. That's got to be a good thing, right? And yeah, it is. So certainly you're protecting an application and its data by implementing encryption where appropriate. And finally, secure logging. Secure logging also helps to protect uh, information by going in and providing you with you know, a record of what's transpired so that you can go in and identify things that have occurred um, and then be able to adapt to them. And by making it secure, again, you're also reducing the likelihood that a would-be attacker is going to be able to go in and tamper with any log files to try and erase any evidence of things that they've done. So again, the best answer on here is fuzzing. A lot of words in this one. A malicious employee has written a script that goes in and changes values in a database prior to a billing application reading those values in that database uh, for generating, say, reports or bills or something like that. Uh, after the billing application runs, the script that the user has written goes in and changes the values back to their original data. My question for you is, is what type of an attack is this? There's your answer choices. Think it through. When you're ready, if you have clicked pause, click play again, and we can walk through them. First answer choice is time of check, time of use. Um, no, that is, sounds close, but it's just not right. Uh, time of check, time of use says that you read a value, and then that value is changed but before, rather than reread the value before using that value, you go in and uh, actually use it. A common example given is the scenario where you have two people on opposite sides of town, both putting their ATM cards in the ATM machine simultaneously. Both of them check the balance, they're the same account. So say, you know, you're, you know, a husband and a wife both check their balance and it says that there's $100 in the checking account. 
Well, you could say that the ATM at that moment knows that there's $100. So the husband withdraws the $100, okay? And then immediately after that, the wife attempts to, from the other ATM machine, withdraw those same $100. Now, if the ATM does not go back and check the balance again, and it still assumes that the balance is $100, it's gonna give the wife $100 as well, which is gonna leave the account with a negative $100 balance. Um, that's a time of check time of use error. In this scenario, we've actually gone in and just modified the data so that it could just be straight read by the process, by this billing application, and then we just went and changed it back afterwards. Uh, that is, it, it might sound a little similar to you, but it's different, okay? Time of check time of use is, as you read it, and then it changes and then it gets used. Um, uh, whereas with um, this particular scenario, we're talking about changing it before it gets used and then changing it after it gets used. So let's keep looking at the other answer choices and see if there's a better, a better solution out there for us. Second answer choice says buffer overflow. No, uh, a buffer overflow is when you have a field that's designed to handle a certain amount of input and more than that is uh, put into it and rather than truncating it or otherwise efficiently or gracefully dealing with it, the adjacent or additional data is overflows into an adjacent area of memory and from there bad things can happen. And none of that describes our scenario in this question. So that's definitely not the right answer. How about the third answer choice, cross-site scripting? Also no. Cross-site scripting is again going in and injecting some code into a web browser. And there's a variety of different ways in which we could go in and do that. None of those are addressed in this question. So again, this question is about changing values, letting them be used, and then changing them back again. So definitely does not fit the definition of what cross-site scripting is. How about a salami attack? Well, we're getting into the neighborhood now. A salami attack is when you go in and you make very small changes um, to a value, and you typically will do so over time. Uh, the hopes being that it's not going to be detected. Now, if I've never mentioned it before, the two most common places that places that people know about uh, the whole idea of salami slicing or salami attacks is first from Superman 3 when Richard Pryor did it, uh, which was a long time ago, and second was in the movie Office Space where they went in and they shaved off fractions of the penny and had them deposited into an account. And in both of those circumstances, it didn't work out particularly well, neither for Richard Pryor nor for uh, the folks at Inatech. So uh, that's definitely not right, the right answer either, but pretty close. That leaves the last answer choice, which is data diddling. And uh, the question really is kind of the textbook definition of what data diddling is. Um, data diddling is the idea that you go in and you change a value, and then somebody reads it or a process uses it, does something with it, as is the case in our question, and then oftentimes afterwards you go in and change the data back to the original value. And uh, when you do that, we call that data diddling. I don't know that anybody ever says data diddling in a meeting or anything like that, but that's the textbook definition of what it's all about.